It is my duty, honor, and privilege to address the city council and the community on the state of our city. Normally, I would be surrounded by my fellow council members, city staff, and members of the public. Tonight, although the council chambers are empty and we're meeting through a screen, I am feeling more connected than ever to all of you. I would like to start by thanking the members of our community. Your love for this city is amazing. You keep our democracy alive, and your stories inspire us in our work every day. Thank you to my dedicated city council colleagues. I can't wait until we're back together in person. In a year that has been anything but ordinary, so too has your leadership been extraordinary. Your resolve, energy, and optimism has helped me be a better mayor and has strengthened our community. I look forward to all our work that still lies ahead to make our city more inclusive, sustainable, and just. I also thank you for putting your confidence in me and Mayor Pro Tem. I want to especially thank Mayor Pro Tem Saleh. Just over one year ago, we celebrated our election results on the first day of Black History Month. I am proud to stand beside you as leaders of this community and as a reminder of what is possible. I am thankful our paths crossed to bring us to this journey today. Finally, last but not least, thank you to the more than 600 outstanding city employees who always go above and beyond to keep this city running. Our bus drivers, police officers, firefighters, waste collection crews, and everyone else from cleaning streets to maintaining our parks, to keeping our residents informed during times of such uncertainty. You are all truly essential workers, and Iowa City is lucky to have you. When I delivered this address one year ago, I had no idea what my first year as mayor had in store. When we look back on 2020, we might recall the challenges of remote learning, the loneliness we felt at times, or the closure of a favorite business. But I hope we also remember the way our community came together. I want to remind us of this good tonight, but please know that the friends and family members who are not able to join us are certainly not forgotten. When we learned just how dangerous this virus was, I took a bold step to mandate mask wearing and protect public health in our community. We work to educate the community on safety measures and provide PPE to those in need. We launched several relief programs to keep our community afloat. Through partnerships with local service agencies, we offer nearly $2 million in rent, utility, and security deposit, assistance to low-income households, aid for small businesses, support for homeless prevention, mental health care, food security, and child care services. And we joined in Project Better Together to provide additional assistance to BIPOC businesses and support for youth in their well-being and education through Neighborhood Nest. Although we couldn't gather in the ways we were used to, we successfully launched the first annual Climate Action Fest virtually transition to a popular drive through farmer's market, help the members of the center stay connected through virtual programming, and even held a drive-in Halloween movie for families. Spending time outdoors was a welcome relief for many this year, so we increased our number of picnic tables and outdoor dining options, added extra snow clearing on more parks and trails, and partnered with Imon to bring free Wi-Fi to some of our parks. We're looking forward to expanding that Wi-Fi to more parks in the coming year. Just as we settled in to finding a new normal, we were surprised by an inland hurricane, the derecho. Again, our staff gave their all with over 5,000 hours of staff time. Our streets team helped collect enough debris to fill Kinnick Stadium 31 feet deep. Park staff helped remove dangerous trees on our streets, parks and trails, and refuse added extra collection routes, opened an additional debris drop-off location, 
and provided free yard waste bags to residents. And while we work closely with Mid-American Energy to get power reestablished in the community as quickly as possible, the library offered free charging stations, laptops, and internet access across the city via the bookmobile. Employees from our fire department assisted in our neighboring Lynn County as they continue to strengthen their emergency preparedness. In 2020, the opening of a new training tower site and the purchase of land for two future fire stations are two more ways our city is preparing to serve the health and safety needs of our growing community. In recent months, we have begun the long overdue and tough conversations on an issue that is extremely and personally important to me, eliminating racial injustice in our community. I know my fellow counselors join me from afar and taken this moment to honor the important lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and all the black lives lost too early to pervasive and systemic racism. Black Lives Matter and your leaders will continue to work to honor that truth. We started by listening to the stories of individuals within our community. We held six Speak Up, Speak Out events and listening posts and had many one-on-one -on -one private conversations about injustice, our hopes, and our fears. To start, we have committed $1 million to social justice and racial equity initiatives, established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and adopted Juneteenth as an official city holiday. A few weeks ago, our city registered in support of a bill at the state level to decriminalize small amounts of marijuana, an offense which contributes to the racial disparity in our criminal justice system. We're restructuring the way we respond to calls for service, recently re-approved a jointly funded street outreach position with the shelter house and a new law enforcement liaison position in partnership with Community and Foundation 2 Crisis Services. These are the first steps in reducing our need to have armed officers respond to calls that are better suited for trained mental health professionals. To our residents who have been so committed to this fight, we hear you and we are not done listening. The preliminary plan to restructure the police that was introduced by the city manager focuses extensively on a continuum of responses to crisis calls for a service, a commitment to unbiased policing and public safety for the 21st century. We are committed to continuing to get feedback on this plan, especially from those who traditionally have barriers and refining the path forward. I was pleased to be joined by my fellow council members in unanimously approving the appointment of our new police chief, Dustin Liston. We know he was the right choice to help us achieve a more community-oriented public safety strategy. One of the upcoming projects he will focus on is our city's role in the new GuyLink Access Center. The city made its final payment of our $2.5 million commitment to this project and we are all looking forward to having this resource within our community. For many years, city councilors in Iowa City have prioritized advancing social justice and racial equity. The reality is that there is still a lot of work to do and there are still residents in our community who don't have equitable access and opportunity. But each year we make incremental but meaningful progress. In 2020, the city's use of a racial equity toolkit to analyze the water utility shutoff policy led to an overhaul of the policy to help families at a time when they needed a hand, not another penalty fee. Equitable employment opportunity is important to us, which is why last year we converted several hourly jobs to permanent positions with benefits. I am also proud of the City Council's commitment to raise the minimum wage for hourly city employees to $15 will be accomplished in our upcoming budget. We continue to sponsor a social justice and racial equity 
grant program with $75,000 each year. This funded important projects in 2020, such as the creation of a multilingual newspaper to inform community members of vital COVID-19 health information. Expansion of translated documents have been a priority of the city in recent years. Language should never be a barrier to full participation in the community. I am pleased to report our partnership with Kirkwood Community College to offer free English language classes of which have found success despite the challenges caused by the pandemic. These opportunities help create a community of inclusion. For the seventh year in a row, Iowa City has earned a perfect score for the LGBTQ plus inclusion on the National Municipal Equality Index. I am hopeful we can safely gather again later this year to celebrate both the 50th and the 51st anniversary of Iowa City Pride. Our Equity and Human Rights Department has been busy hosting trainings and programs for the community, including partnering with the Business Partnership to sponsor a Humanize My Hoodie workshop for local business and organizations. Our counselors and staff look forward to continuing to support these offerings and participate in the Juneteenth celebration, MLK Day celebration, and other important cultural celebrations. In addition to virtual events, I have made it a priority to keep our residents connected with all the awesome and amazing nonprofits and agencies in our city. Each month I spotlight a different guest on our Community Connections program, which is broadcast on City Channel 4, Facebook, and YouTube. As city councilors, we recognize just how vital these social service agencies are to our community. We've committed to investing in their success and have approved considerable increases to our annual Aid to Agencies grant program in recent years. Our upcoming budget includes another 3.5% increase for this program. We're also calling for another $1 million for affordable housing. I look forward to the outreach work of the new steering committee tasked with recommending an updated affordable housing action plan. In 2020, we made progress in increasing affordable units in the downtown with six units at the Augusta Place Apartments and the acquisition of five units for public housing at the Chauncey. We are also excited that as part of the South District Home Ownership Program, we now have two more affordable duplex units for sale for residents of the neighborhood and are working to put additional units for sale in 2021. Later this spring, City Council will consider adopting a form-based zoning code in the South District, providing property owners more revitalization opportunities in this historic and vibrant neighborhood. Elsewhere in and around the city, City Council has focused on creating sustainable solutions to development in our community. City staff are currently preparing a commercial tax abatement program to help incentivize development along the Highway 1-6 corridor. We also expect to add millions to our affordable housing fund through fee and lieu payments negotiated in TIF development agreements. This includes $1.8 million from the downtown Tailwind project, which will bring a much-needed boost to an otherwise slow year for economic activity. The Tailwind project also designates several of these downtown buildings as local historic landmarks. This joins our earlier landmark designation of the Civil War era property at 410 through 412 North Clinton Street. The Tailwind project will also pursue LEED Gold certification as a result of our city's commitment to aggressive climate action. Last year, we adopted the Accelerating Iowa City's Climate Action Report and have made considerable progress. The design for the city's new public works facility was guided by our climate action plan and received an award for excellence in energy efficiency design in October. The Climate Action and Outreach Office also launched new energy efficiency incentives for industrial properties in TIF districts and provided $50,000 in climate action grants for projects like 
local food production for immigrant, refugee, and low-income residents. We continue to make progress towards our goal of reducing carbon emissions by 45 percent by 2030. We've seen over 60 acres of new prairie planted, launched a tree planting voucher program, and welcomed our first class of community climate ambassadors. The way our city moves is also important in reaching our emission reduction goals. As of this summer, all city parking ramps are now equipped with electric vehicle charging stations. We received a $3 million grant from the USDOT to purchase our first electric buses later this year. This is the first of many exciting changes to our transit system. With the transit study complete, we hope to launch new routes this summer. City staff are coordinating with Corville to improve consistency to the fare structure and connectivity across the systems. Planning is also underway for pilot programs to offer late night and Sunday bus service. For our two-wheeled commuters, we continue to make progress on our bike master plan. You might see the first green bike boxes now marked in several intersections throughout the city. These are a part of a continued effort to improve the safety of our streets for cyclists, vehicles, and pedestrians alike. Several new bike lanes and bike boulevards were completed in 2020 and projects this coming year will include a side path along Highway 6 and bike lanes on Benton Street and Gilbert Street. This summer we will apply for gold bicycle friendly status which would make Iowa City the first to achieve this designation in the state of Iowa. The pandemic has encouraged people to spend more time outside enjoying Iowa City's beautiful and well-maintained park and trail system. We're committed to improving our parks and natural areas each year, adding amenities and making accessibility upgrades. Last year we made progress on parks and playground improvements at Weatherby, Napoleon, Scott, Fair Meadows, and Lower City Park. Staff will tackle Court Hill Glendale and Chattuck Green Parks in the coming year. I am excited to receive a recommendation soon for renaming Creekside Park in honor of a personal inspiration of mine and the first African-American writer to win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, the late James Allen McPherson. City staff is also kicking off a recreation master plan process to explore how our recreational facilities, programming, athletic fields and aquatic centers can better serve our community. Although the members of the center haven't been able to gather in person, I am excited that they can look forward to many improvements that will provide a more accessible and welcoming space for everyone. Finally, I am proud to be a part of a city council who continues to prioritize support for arts and culture in our community. With the city's assistance, Public Space One took ownership of their home on the north side in 2020. The recent development agreement for the Tailwind project creates a new permanent home for the Riverside Theater. Our city contributed $1 million to the local Strengthen, Grow and Evolve Arts campaign, supporting the historic renovation of the Englert Theater. It was a moment to celebrate when the rehabilitated iconic Englert marquee was unveiled and lit up once again. I am optimistic we will find more of these pockets of light in the coming year. But this is not a blind optimism. I know we have many challenges ahead and our path forward may at times be lined with sacrifice and struggle. The words of our Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. tells us, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. There may be times we have to walk or even crawl in the months ahead, but I know our city is in a strong position to push forward towards an equitable recovery. I am honored to be your mayor. I look forward to working alongside Johnson County Public Health, the university, our neighboring cities, my fellow counselors, city staff, boards and commissions, and all of our awesome and amazing organizations and members of this community. 
all of us working together, doing whatever we can to keep moving forward.